Welcome to everyone. This webinar takes place in a series uh, that describes the product of our ontology community of practice and the progress made. We ask Carlos Quiroz to introduce the latest development of the future Coop Ontology website. Carlos is a senior digital developer uh, and co-leader of the digital solution team in uh, the Alliance Biodiversity SEAT. Welcome everybody. So, so yes, my name is Carlos Quiroz and I work for the Alliance Biodiversity SEAT. And um, so um, we, we were discussing maybe um, since one year ago um, how we can actually improve the crop ontology website. Um, so today what we're going to talk is like uh, what has been advanced in the website, but also in relationship with to what the um, using visualizations and using graph, graph databases. So um, most of my presentation is, is related to that, the advances, but also connected a little bit on the, um, um, the advances of crop ontology, but connected to what is what certain design decisions that were made when in selecting the graph databases and so on. So uh, where are we coming from? So basically the Chrome Ontology websites, um, it was it was a very static website, difficult to maintain uh, content. The ontological data was stored in a document-based database. Um, this is, um, you know, there are different kind of databases around. So you have um, SQL databases that are more structured databases, document -based databases, and also graph databases in this case. So the origin of the document, the data was stored in a document -based database. It was more or less a flat structure where, um, um, uh, which, which is term is a document inside this database and uh, maybe has type, for example, a trait of a method. Um, there was a little semantic search engine, uh, very little semantic, semantic inferring capacity, and also limited non-semantic search engine. So what we're trying to, to look at is uh, how, um, how we make improvements or try to make an improvements in this website. So one of the things is that first um, we they took into consideration was the user. So, in, in the design of, of that, that, that will drive the, um, the architectural changes and how the website will, will be. For example, um, we have, in terms of users, we have non-ontology savvy users, okay? This is the normal people like, um, like in, in most of the scientists, people that are not working on ontology directly, you know, that basically, them, for example, they are told to link variables or concepts to ontological terms, for example, that they, they um, ontology people tell them that it's important. For example, they have a variable or a concept and they want the, the, the most appropriate ontological term for it. Um, but the problem with all these ontologies is that they end up swimming in a sea of terms. Okay, it's very, it's very difficult for them to to really say, okay, what is, what is, the, what is the most closest term um, that I can use? So one of the main design considerations to on developing something that the crop ontology was like a, how to provide intelligent access to ontologies uh, uh, for, such, for such kind of users. Okay. The other side, um, the design consideration is that those that are ontology savvy users you know, that they want to make the best with the ontology. For example, ontology, people that work on ontology want to generate new knowledge by inference in, by inference with ontologies. For example, um, if we have a lot of ontologies and we connected to the, um, you know, um, to the SDG ontology um, bridge. Um, so we, we would like to know, for example, do a semantic query to determine the contribution of alliance data opus to SDGs. So instead of, of you saying, okay, um, somebody manually going and say, oh, the, what this data set contributes to SDG1, or oh, this data set contributes to SDG2, and so on. If you have, for example, ontologies connected to, um, ontology connected to the, to the SDGs and ontologies connected to particular data sets, you were able to, to do a query using an ontological query to know to know that. Also, it's important um, um, 
what they would like also is, for example, identify gaps and areas of improvement. For example, the, the more intelligent you know, our ontologies is the better. And this is um, because if, when, if we want to do inferences between, uh, for example, across ontologies, um, if, if, if our terms are more interconnected in terms of linkages and, and linkages with other ontologies, the better that the, the more inferencing that we can actually do. So they would like to see also the ontology savvy people. They would like to say, okay, how 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 does my ontology look? Okay. So these design considerations drive or um, help us drive the, the architectural considerations. Okay, so so then we we start moving from a flat structure to a hierarchical structure. Okay, so in this case, we what we try and start was looking at um, the use of a graph, da graph database. So basically a graph database, or a, we call it triple store, um, it's, a, it's a kind of database that, for example, um, is store nodes, like for example, A and B, but also can store connections between A and B. For example, if, um, if A is the alliance and B is Carlos Quiroz as a person, the, collect, the connection between um, alliance A, A and B, Carlos can be by is employed uh, of the alliance or belongs to the alliance and, and so on. So in a triple store in the, what is a graph database, you not only store the, the alliance as, um, as, as, as an entity, um, Carlos as an entity, but also the connection between. Uh, there, are, there are several, um, Tools are out there that, that um, maybe some of them, some, some of them you have known or have seen. So one of them is called Virtuoso Universal Server, uh, that is, um, you know, has been around for a while. Uh, Neo4j, uh, that is um, one of the newest technologies on on the, on graph databases, and there is also a little graph. Um, some of them are open source, some others are not. Um, in this case, I'm marking um, a Neo4j in, in bold, given um, because it's the one that, that, that we selected to use for our ontological database. And, and the selection here in, um, was done, or I did, um, based on, the, um, on whether it is open source, whether there is a, a big community of practice of people, uh, you know, um, helping or users on how to use the graph database. And also how fast and how lightweight can be the, the, the solution. For example, Virtuoso Universal Service is, is in my perspective huge. Um, uh, it's, it's very heavy. So so if we wanted to have it in as for an authority database, it, will, it could be it could be cumbersome. So if, in that in that sense, uh, Neo4j was the, one of the best options. So if we think about moving from the flat structure to a hierarchical structure and connected to graph database that we can do inferencing, then we're tackling uh, one of the, the, the challenges or um, the, that ontological people would like to have, be able to do the inferencing and so on. But the other side is that for the normal user. So, um, the other architectural consideration is like indexing the terms using their metadata. So in our crop ontology, each term or each node um, that is that we have, it is have sufficient metadata. It has the name, the description, the author, uh, what is used for, and so on. So what we did it was um, having all the terms indexed into a, what we call a search engine. And then there are also there are examples of search engine. The, the, one of the, the most common used these days is called Elasticsearch. And basically what we did was um, to put all the terms in Elasticsearch with the older metadata. And then, but we also provide inside um, the, the, in, in the moment that we move the data into the search engine, we put specific filters that the, that the search engine could use and the user could use. So for example, we put um, the attribute of um, a specific uh, entity, for example, if it's a variable, a metadata scale, and then the authority that it belongs and others. 
So that would give us the, the possibility of a user saying, okay, I would like to search for maize gill as a variable, or maize gill as a metal, or maize gill as a scale. So that is, the, as an entry point for the user, it's very easy to know, okay, yes, there is a, there is a term uh, or a variable that is, um, if, I search, if I search, sorry, for maize gill as a variable, they will tell me maybe three, three or four in the, in the, in the maize ontology, for example. So, so then the, with that small uh, set, he can make a more informed decision on maybe which term is going to be the one that he's going to use. So basically in our, on our crop, new crop ontology website, we have two different kind of, how you call it, architectural or, or background um, storage. The Neo4j that stores the structure of the ontology in terms of connections and um, between the entities or the terms. And in other side, we have the search engine that is used particularly for users that would like to search um, very quickly for a variable connected to, for example, a, a particular ontology. In creating something like this, you need to have a programming consideration. For example, um, we wanted to, uh, to use open source. Um, that is um, one of the main considerations that we have. So then, um, then program um, the new portal using a language and libraries that allows extensibility. So in this case, what we did was use a combination of uh, Python, which is the programming language, Pyramid, which is a module for creating web applications, and PUTLib, that is uh, another library for creating components. Um, and this is the same uh, development stack that we use in another software called Climo, that basically, if we want to expand um, the, um, the web the, the web service or the web app to, um, to to different to accommodate different users or different capabilities we can do it very well uh, using a component architecture that we can plug in and plug um, and plug out components into the into the website um, the third consideration um, that we're trying to address was the um, that the original versa was very needed the customization capabilities. If you wanted to maybe change some some of the text in, in our website, it was very difficult. It, well, not difficult, but it, it required like somebody had to go uh, to the code and change the, um, the text. For example, if if um, the email address changed, you need to go. The programmer need to go and change the text in the uh, programmatically um, in the in the original files. So we wanted to give also a little bit of content management system, like um, like um, maybe you, some of you have used uh, WordPress or Drupal, where you you create the, the pages um, live on on the, on the web interface. So we wanted to do the same for the crop ontology, and for this, what we use is a is a, is a component that is called CK Editor, that basically it it provides you the um, um, it provides you that um, the means to do that, to allow the people or the user to create a database on, on in real time, or the content of the database in real time. So, what is the current status? So, for example, we have on the um, on the left hand side we have the website content that how it looks right now, and then you see it in the in the right side we have the website content editor. The basically um, users um, you can see in that in the section of content here. Um, that there is a full toolbox where users can edit the text, put text in bold, create links, put pictures, put um, you know videos, and so on. And everything is um, when you save it, this automatically is reflects into the content of for the for the use for for the real um, for the user that want to see the, the enter to the crop ontology website. So in, the, in this case, um, for example, if, if Elizabeth uh, or somebody else that uh, administers or maintains the crop ontology, um, um, Elizabeth can go and say, I want to change this email address in this content and automatically will reflect into the content of the database without intervention of me or any other programmer of the, of the, of the website. Um, we also have what we call an, an ontology explorer. That is, this is one of the 
one of the things, um, and I will go into details um, later on, that, for example, I'm showing here the potato ontology. And and explorer, you can you can have a graph, um, um, a, a visualization of how your ontology is, how it is connected um, to certain elements, but also how um, it creates like a different kind of domains and the different terms are connected to these domains. In the case of uh, what we call these uh, domains will be the traits that you have like uh, morphological traits or biological traits and then different terms are connected to that. But you can actually have um, a visual representation that helps you determine areas of maybe maybe you, you need to create more interconnection between your your terms inside um, inside the, the, the ontology. This is on the left, the ontology explorer. On the right, you, while we have the search engine and results, this is um, the left side, um, the explorer is more for ontological people that would like to explore the ontology and see how the ontology is interpreted structure. The right side is for the normal user that he will say, oh, well, I have a, I want to search for tuber variables that are connected to tuber in the, and I also want to search in the, um, um, you can actually filter by, um, by a particular ontology. And then it tells you here in the in the lower levels, for example, it tells you, okay, we have in the ontology jams, um, we have the, the term code um, 0434, there is a variable, the name of the variable, and then that related, how it relates to different traits. So then you can, you can start exploring um, or making a decision on which term is the most appropriate for the one that you're looking for. Also, a different kind of um, kind of explorer of um, using a like a kind of a tree-based um, um, exploration tool that that you can see, for example, in here. If I go to potato to the agronomic traits and the average or macro tuber weight, it tells me which variables are connected to that particular trait, and then the information or the metadata for the trait. So all this metadata is the one that is indexed into Elastic, into Elasticsearch, and that and the, and the search um, capabilities are used in order to to look for for information. So Elasticsearch index everything that is there. So to finalize a little bit of the, the crop ontology website. Um, so we our roadmap right now in, includes the the incorporation of the API plus interoperability. Um, the upload and update of terms and managing a little bit of uh, ontology versioning and then the testing, um, of course, and then launching the new site. So that is in the, um, um, what the steps that let's say in the coming weeks are going to happen. Okay, so a little bit of, um, I'll talk a little bit of graph, graph database and visualization. Um, there are three areas that, that that, that are involved into achieving something like this. Um, the first one is um, to think about um, when do you need um, um, a graph database and, and for what purpose you want to use a graph database. In the, in the terms of um, on ontologies, um, when we look at a particular term is connected to another term and there is a kind of relationship between in, in that connection, so then you will start thinking, and, and, and also you want to make, um, generate new knowledge on knowing something about those connections or how the nodes are connected internally into in, in, the, in the ontology. So then I will argue that maybe you, you want to move your data into a graph database. It is not that everything needs to move into a graph database. You know, um, there are other databases that are more specialized uh, for all the kinds of things. For example, if you want to store, um, um, you know, field, um, field data, you know, that usually you store it and that you have um, like the data that come from ODK, for example, you can conveniently store it into a document-based database or you store it into a MySQL database, okay, as rows. Because then each row represent, you know, um, a specific set of, of, of data, for example, a household. Okay, 
But if you say, no, what I want to represent is that, um, as in my early example, that Carlos belongs to an organization, I want to, I want to store and use information on those connections, then maybe you want to use that. And there are also the, there are design considerations. For example, um, you, if you want to make the best use of your graph database, you need to start thinking, okay, um, let's say that you, um, you need to identify not only the, those entities that you want to connect, but which attributes those entities will have. For example, what we call here node type, for example, Carlos belongs to Alliance, but Carlos um, is um, is from from Costa Rica. Carlos um, is uh, has a specific gender. Uh, Carlos has certain age. Carlos um, has certain skills. Okay, and then biodiversity has certain also property that says biodiversity is on, is an organization. It is. Um, um, in, it's in, in it's in based in Rome, also based in Colombia, and and so on. And also that that times are, uh, you can also need to establish maybe some the relation between one node and another from Carlos and Biodiversity as nodes. That relationship you you also wanted to qualify in order to make the best of your of your ontology database. You can also make just a connection between two nodes, but if you don't establish that relationship. It will, you know, it's, you know, it, it's not much that you can actually do. Just saying that A is connected to B. Um, the other side, um, the second area is um, that, of course, you need um, some sort of programming cap capacity, okay, um, to be able to extract the data from from a graph database. So in this case, what we what we did uh, for our crop database, uh, sorry, for our crop ontology website, uh, we use, we use Python, and we also we also have here um, uh, JSON, which is a data format, and um, and then what we did it was created software to read a new new for your database and um, and creating a structure in JSON that represents the connection between nodes and um, and the coloring of the nodes and so on. That that the third part that is in, at, the, at the far at the far right it is the graph visualization. That in this case we use um, uh, we use a tool called um, D3. The D3 is the stand for data driven documents. That is a, a technology an open source technology for creating graph visualizations. So um, basically, what um, D3 is is a, is a portion of Complex code, I will, I will say. It. Um, in this case, we we had to outsource this um, um, this piece of code uh, to somebody else um, outside of our organization. So um, in this in this way, the, the visualization reads the JSON that come from Neo4j and prints or creates this the, the graphs that um, that goes into the ontology explorer. In order to have the um, visualizations. Uh, you know, is you need to have these three components, and the visualization part is, I would say, that is the most complicated. For the crop ontology, we have to source it because we we didn't have that capacity on on, on site. But that these are the three components that maybe when you thinking about creating a website, coming using the um, a, a graph database, and you want to provide the visualization to the user, you will need to maybe go into these three these three, into these three steps. This concludes my my presentation. I'm open to questions. Thank you very much, Carlos, for your presentation. I can see that Maya no other questions. Thank you very much, Carlos, for your presentation. It's been great. So, so you mentioned that for the data extraction part, you were using uh, JSON, and I was wondering if you you would consider exposing uh, the graphs as RDF documents, or or that's not in the roadmap. Yes, definitely. Um, that that's the that's, that's so. Indeed, we are now now at our question was in order to connect the data from 
from the Neo4j database into mm. our visualization part. Right. But uh, but in the crop ontology, you can export it directly from Neo4j into RDF. Uh -huh. that is, this is something that also um, was driving my my consideration on the on when when I use Neo4j or when you use um, a graph database. That the graph database provides um, in you know in build capabilities to export directly to RDF. Uh, originate our website. Um, maybe we need to create code or or use libraries to convert data from a flat structure into RDF, mm. and then you need to cater for your own, for example, mistakes in in creating the RDF format. Right. Whereas, for example, Neo4j um, automatically converts it directly uh, from from the Neo4j database into RDF. So. So for, him, for for us it was it was great because then you you know that um, you know that, that the format is has been has been looked at and is proper. So you so that is something that um, that is draws our consideration for Neo4j. But uh, in the in the in the database in the in the new crop ontology website you were able to ex to export directly an ontology from Neo4j into RDF. Fantastic. Thank you. Very, very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos. Um, Crawford, I see that you have a very similar question. Is it already answered or do you have um, more, to, more to add? Hi, Carlos. Um, Hello. Yeah, I guess I was interested in the, the kind of open source versus um, proprietary trade-offs and then the kind of, you know, moving forwards and backwards. And it's always a challenge, um, you know, even if you compare JSON with XML, uh, there's always that trade-off between simplicity and, and sort of speed of use compared to kind of, you know, observing a totally open standard. So, I mean, as I understand it, with Neo4j, you essentially have a labeled property graph, yeah? So mm -hmm. both, your, both your connections and your nodes can have labeled attributes, exactly. which strictly speaking is not adhering to RDF, although RDF star, of course, uh, gives a sum of that. So it's a little bit more cumbersome to express those in RDF. But I guess the benefit is when they're in RDF, then you can use things like sort of standard open source OWL frameworks, you know, for doing some of your inference or even for doing some of your visualization. So I just wondered how you thought about those trade-offs. And then also when it came to exporting from Neo4j through JSON to your visualization, it sounds like you're not using any of the kind of standard query you know, so, so Neo4j has its Cypher, you know, built-in query language. And then if we were an RDF, I guess we could have Sparkle endpoint. So how do you sort of balance up these uh, open source versus commercial decisions when you're working in a practical project like this? Well, the, the, the balance is like a trying to say what, um, for example, in terms of whether you use commercial or, or, open, or open standards, what we look at is like, um, the consideration is like a, how in, in the terms of the uh, our website it was, okay, um, which solution, for example, if we talk about Virtuoso, Neo4j, and Aura can give us the best, the, the, the best capabilities for the less resources that maybe we, we will have. Running a Virtuoso server is sometimes, um, because it's, it's, it's not just RDF, it is um, managed all the kinds of entities. Is not just a graph database or um, or, or a triple store database, so so then maybe we don't we don't need it as, as, as such a massive server. So when we look at that, at the, when we're looking around Neo4j and stand out in, in, in that. Um, second, um, the the storage of the database and then the queries that you can do, um, you, you, whether you use Cypher or you use um, a Spark to SQL, um, that what we saw, it is um, in in Cypher is also an advantage of how to how to write your queries, whether you use um, not just a select, but but the way that you structure queries is quite quite simple, um, using even kind of JSON notation. So, but at the end, the product that you that you get from the Neo4j can go into an open standard like RDF, and then from there you can plug it into other kinds of visualization that that works on RDF format. So it doesn't matter whether you store it directly in RDF or you store it into 
into Neo4j, you know that you're going to have that interoperability capability at the end that people will be able to search um, um, using, our, um, for example, uh, if, you, if, you, if you get the RDF, you can then use your own capacities. Um, particularly for the JSON, um, what we did it was the, um, an um, the extraction of the Neo4j into JSON for them to move into that visualization. We did it uh, ourselves. It's not automatically done, particularly because the, the, the structure the structure of data that the visualization part needs it is very specific. Um, so, so that's why we created a, that ex, that export component um, um, manually. Or saying saying I, I did that uh, the exportation component, and then give it into the visualization part. Um, and the visualization reads that JSON in order to create a visualization. And the visualization also we base of on, on on open source code that it was available on the web. That um, and then using as I said we we got some other people, um, um, an external person to modify that code and adapt it to our needs, because um, uh, the, the visualization part in D3 is quite complex. Thanks very much, Carlos. Thank you very much for your question, uh, Profod, and for your answer, uh, Carlos. Uh, Casey, you, you have a, a question. Hi, just a couple of questions. I was wondering if you're using Neo Semantics at all for any of the um, JSON handling or parsing slash exporting, as well as for exporting into RDF or yes. whether you wrote your own tools. No, Neo Semantics. Neo Semantics yeah. is, um, is the plugin that we use. Um, because uh, they already have the import and export capabilities and all the inferring, um, inferring capabilities. Yeah, so so that's what I said. Like uh, when you when you go around and looking, you know, you are in the market for a for uh, for a, a triple store uh, database like a graph database. So then you say, okay, I, I I need to have the RDF capability to be able to export my data, whether it's a store in Neo 4 j into into RDF. So instead of, of right. Carlos writing the code that I'm making a lot of mistakes and, and, and in the code <laughs> create RDF, I just rely on the on the on the neo semantics for that. Yes. Okay. And are you using just straight JSON or JSON LD? Uh, no. In the in the exportation of the data for the visualization is just JSON, plain JSON. Okay. Yes. Because that's the structure that um that you know that we that I borrowed from the internet. You use it a JSON yeah. as power in the graph behind. So basically I use the same um, I need to create the same kind of a structure coming from Neo4j. And once I gave that structure I could give it to um, to this specialized programmer to to adapt that visualization code that it was on the web to to the one that I needed. Okay, well, thank you so much. Elizabeth, you have a um, comment for uh, Carlos. Yes, Carlos. Uh, among our at, uh, attendees today, we have some of the ontology curators, and I think they would be interested to see, if possible, a short demo of some of the key features you, you showed. This. I can maybe share my screen again. And I, what I wanted to add, uh, particularly for the curators, contributors to the crop ontology, the decision to upgrade the site was taken because the previous site was more than 12 years old, and it was the backend was showing some uh, weaknesses. So to avoid uh, having too many problems, uh, we discussed with Carlos, who had uh, some solutions for the upgrade. So this was the driving reason of this upgrade. So, so basically, this is how our new crop ontology website looks. Um, let me just um, remove that. So, so basically, we have um, our um, our headings that is um, editable headings, but also we have our our crop ontologies here, and we have the different uh, the ontology explorer. So the first thing that maybe I can look at is maybe the search engine. So, for example, I have here, and um, Let's let's look for plant size. So this is the, the main starting point of maybe a normal user that said, well, I have plant size and I want to connect it to, to an ontological term. So it said like, okay, I want to plant size. And it tells me that it 
that is there are very little information is like about this is showed numbers without decimals but basically it's only two terms that we have plant size so it tells me that is uh, the term plant size in the ontology solens penotype ontology and also we have in here in the in the plant height in meters in the inside our brassica um, um, ontology and this variable is connected to um, to the seed um, the seed space and traits um, polyoli length polyoli width and so on so so this is the um, plant height yeah so in this case we have 84 terms okay and we have the different uh, we have traits and methods and so on that we have so basically what then what I can do here is say okay I'm, I'm interested also in my term types I'm interested in variables okay so if I interested in variables that are term type uh, sorry um, uh, plant length plant height so then it tells me that there is one directly connected like that there is in sweet potato okay and then I can explore the um, um, I can go and get the information about this particular ontological term. For example, I want to open in a new, a new tab. So it tells me here, okay, there is a sweet potato. And then it loads, it tells me here where in this, where in, how is it structured that particular variable? And it tells me the metadata about the variable. So then let's say it like, um, no, I, I don't want to, I'm not interested in, in variables. So I go back. So I have my 84 terms. And, um, and then I can maybe interested in, in methods, okay? So in this case, it's showing me 32, the, all the methods. So this is the way of kind of a slice in the, 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 on, on the, the ontologies. So in this, in this case, if you see that this particular filter, this is happening right now with Elasticsearch. Um, that information, of, of course, Elasticsearch is, is also requesting information to Neo4j and maybe tell me what traits this particular method belongs to, but not, um, it's not 100%, the search is 100% done in Elasticsearch because it's, it's also very fast and then you can very, you can easily slide your data um, using what they call it facets. Okay, so that is 100% um, of what is happening here in the background. Elasticsearch and a little bit of, of, um, of Neo4j. On the other hand, if, um, if I go here to the group ontology and I go, let's say to the potato, and I go to the potato ontology and I go to the ontology explorer, what, we're going to see here it is a visual representation of of the um, apotate ontology so then i can go and zoom in and say okay as this is very interesting because you can see right now here that we have like a three particular three main areas we have uh, this area here this here in the middle, another area here, and another one here. And then you have connections between um, this area here to the area down here. And we, we can see that maybe that connection, it is a scale, okay? That is the percentage, okay? So here when I'm also in, in our version, it says like, okay, with a credit on percentage, you can see that what is the, the parents and which one are the children, meaning like, uh, okay, the um, um, percentage depends on these uh, methods. And also these variables are the ones that are connected to this particular um, scale. Okay, so we can go down, we can go back again. Um, and see then what the biggest the biggest connection with all of them is of course the the potato that is the the root that is the the, the, the potato 
or the potato item that joins all the different all the different traits. In this case, I think this. my um, in this case that my quality traits yeah okay okay i'll go click fit again just to go back to to what i was before so so this is the kind of um visualization so in the background is is totally neo4j because neo4j tells um okay you are connected to this item is connected to this item and then if you see here in the different kind of connections, you see that um, we have variable of scale of um, and so on. So that is inside Neo4j is, um, is um, that is that the, con the connection between each node. There is a scale of, is a variable of, is a item of, or is related to, if it's very generic. Okay. So this code, um, I have to say um, it is uh, we we borrow it from from another example that it was on the internet and then um if you ask me how how it's done in the background uh, i would need to maybe sit down for a for maybe a few days in order to understand it very well but um but basically what it has is a is a json structure behind it and then uh, d3 picks the json structure of data and then prints it into the to the, the browser so that's kind of the two areas that I wanted to show in the in the crop ontology. So I don't know if there are more questions, more questions there. Yeah, thank you, Carlos. The graph visualization will be, uh, yeah. we need to get acquainted to it, but it's a way of um, curating the ontology as well, because you can focus, zoom in and see where a term is connected and perhaps you can improve uh, mm -hmm. the ontology content by, by this uh, approach also. Exactly. Um, yeah. And uh, so, Carlos, uh, we could say that uh, for, for the beta tester, we will contact them and uh, probably exactly. uh, we would like to release uh, the site by end of April, something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. So there will be still things to do, but at least have the, the minimum features available. So Marie-Angélique, mm -hmm. who is connected, is working with you as well to mm -hmm. re-implement the API calls that are used by uh, the OLS, AgroPortal, and in all of exactly. our That's what we do in Drena, exactly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos, for your time, for preparing this webinar, and for taking the questions. Yeah. And if you have a, for a, quick, a question later on, you can direct it to Elisabeth or to myself, or to Maria Angelique, and then uh, we were able to, to, to get back to you. Yes, exactly. You have here the contact of Elizabeth. I wish you all a great day. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you.